Well, good morning and uh, welcome. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming in person and braving the cold. Thanks, uh, everybody, joining us online who's not braving the cold. Um, or maybe it's cold at your house. I don't know. Uh, but grateful that we can be here together to worship. And uh, I'm excited for this year, excited for uh, coming together, excited for all the good things that happened in a new year. But I'm curious, like, uh, like thumbs up, thumbs down, or like, you know, intermediate, how you feel like this year compared to the end of last year? Like, is it a thumbs up? Is it a, uh, it's about the same, worse? Like, okay, come on, come on, come on. It's hard to tell, got to tell, Okay. Lots of thumbs up, a few like, eh, I don't know, it's, you know, kind of in between. You know, I shared a little bit like that Christmas wasn't uh, like leading into Christmas. I'm like, I got all these good reasons for it to be perfect, but I wasn't feeling it. Um, like, but since Christmas, I'm like, gosh, I wish it was Christmas again. Like, isn't that funny? Like, you know, how that works sometimes and in, in our lives and, and in those things. And as we're looking for that, and I go, man, with this cold weather, I was like, whew, I don't know if I'm loving that necessarily. Uh, I am super grateful for everybody who helped with the clothing drive today uh, to be able to take to uh, some of the, the migrants and refugees uh, that will go later today. Um, they kind of got overwhelmed with the amount of stuff. So if anybody here in loca in, uh, that's here right now would like to help kind of sort and take that over to the shelter in Lakewood, uh, they'd love some help after service. And Marcelina will be at the table in the back if you want to help and have room or some time to be able to drive that over there. Uh, they'd love some help doing that, so you can talk to them about that. But, um, you know, I was thinking as uh, this idea of, like, things and how it goes and how it doesn't, and, uh, you know, we're starting off this year talking, um, in the, the whole year, talking about wisdom. And we're going to talk about the, this beginning month here, talking about fearing of the Lord and this resolution of the soul, like having this idea of understanding godly fear. If you haven't been here, um, you should definitely listen online there. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, but... I wanted you to ponder something as we're starting here. Have you ever been in a spot where, like, being scared actually turned out to be a good thing? You know, because most of the time we're like, hey, we're talking, talking about don't live in fear and don't be held back. But there's times where you go, eh, a little trepidation, a little slowing, a little more forethought sometimes is a good thing, right? Maybe, uh, maybe it's you, you paused before jumping into something risky. Or maybe it's that time uh, that fear stopped you from walking into something that was actually dangerous, I think usually we think of fear as something that's bad, but sometimes it's more helpful, like a nudge that keeps us safe. And, uh, you know, I was trying to think of a good example for this, and uh, I, I was talking to a buddy of mine, and uh, years ago, we went on this hog hunt in uh, Oklahoma, and like, in the part of Oklahoma that I don't think is on most maps in Oklahoma, Okay. <laughs> Uh, it is like not a normal culture where this is, and uh, there's a bunch of these feral hogs that go in and just like tear apart farmland and home and like foundations and farms and gardens, and it's a mess, right? So uh, we were there, and uh, we had talked to, to um, somebody about trying to find a place to like go and try and hunt these hogs, and this guy's like, oh, I know this landowner. He's got all these hogs. He's really sick of them. He really wants some help. It's in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, we are already in the middle of nowhere. And it's the directions where it's like, hey, when you hit that oak tree, take a right. And, you know, like, so we find this place, right? We finally get over there, and we're walking, and we go way back in there. And in this, like, it's like these little, little rolling hills with all this scrub oak stuff, and you can't see very far. And we come in, like, kind of over this little whole hill, and there's a shack. Now, like, if you've ever seen the new movie Deliverance, that kind of shack, Okay. <laughs> And normally, my inclination is like, ooh, let's go check it out. Like, like that, you know, maybe there's something fun in there. And like, that is just normally how I am. Typically, my wife goes, what is wrong with you? Right? And normally, my buddy Ty is very much like my wife, like, whoa, slow down. Like, we shouldn't do that. Like, very cautious, much more thoughtful than I am most of the time. And uh, this occasion, he's like, oh, let's go check it out. And I was like, dude, I don't know. I just, oh, it's creepy for me. He's like, ah, it's fine. So we start walking. We get kind of close, and we're, we're in kind of like the front yard, um, which is like just where there was less bush uh, around this house, and we hear something inside this house. And I was like, uh-uh. And I just turned to him, and in my heart, I was like, run. And so I just looked to him. I go, dude, run. And I turned, and I just hit a dead sprint. And he was like, what? And he started running. 
and and because he's like Hans is running, I must I must need to run. So I start running as fast as I can. Ty was much better shape than I was. He outruns me, and uh, kind of like that whole thing with like Jesus and the you know getting to the tomb and whatever. So he outruns me. We're gone maybe ten seconds, and somebody in that house starts shooting. And I don't know if they're shooting at us or shooting to scare us, but it did the latter really well. And so we ran straight to that truck, get in the truck, drive away, and, you know, like all the adrenaline and all of the laughing, (laughs) we almost died, right? So it was one of those times that I don't know if I ever told my wife the whole story of that, probably, you know, (laughs) she's like, nope. Um, You know, and I go, that kind of leads us into what I really want to talk about, of that, that sometimes we, we really want to dive in to different things, but I think sometimes we need to dive into having a healthy fear. Because this healthy fear, there should be this balance of godly reverence and life's risks. Like, we can't live in fear of everything. That's unhealthy. And that, like, you know, people go to counseling and get medication for that, right? Um, and it becomes an issue. But um, it, it also is really difficult sometimes when you're looking at this stuff and going, I don't know what I should do. I don't know what this should look like. And how do I, how do I deal with this? Because I think oftentimes we got to look at this and understand, especially with our connection to God, that sometimes fear isn't always a negative. It can actually be a good thing and help be healthy in our spiritual lives. And I think in our everyday lives, fear is supposed to be this, this like alarm system. There is something innate in us where you go, oh, creepy house. I maybe should feel creepy, right? Or you're jumping off of a cliff and you don't know what's underneath you. You should have some fear in that because it can kill you. And and I think in our spiritual journey, fear takes on a totally different role. It's not about us steering clear of physical danger. Instead, it's recognizing and respecting who God is and understanding that. We talked a lot about that last week. I'll touch on a little bit today. But we got to understand our place and our relationship with God, that he is all-powerful. He calls the shots. He makes the rules, and that we need to respond with deep respect and amazement at who God is. You know, when I think about Jesus Christ, I I think of somebody who was a little bit, I hear this in the right way, dangerous, because he, he took risks. He was not about playing it safe or sticking to the norm. He was all about shaking it up, right? Like, Jesus went in there. He was never about going with the flow. He stood up against Uh, what wasn't right. He made sure that he spoke against things that were wrong. And if it meant ruffling feathers, he did it. And as disciples of Jesus, we're called to do that. You're like, yeah, but it might hurt their feelings. You go, oh, but if somebody says, I want to follow Jesus, but I don't want to follow the Bible, we should probably talk about that, right? And help understand and, and make sure that we're doing that. And I think we're asked as his followers to do the same thing, things that aren't always easy. And it's, and if, if it wasn't about, you know, being comfortable in, in our relationship with God, it's about being true to what Jesus calls us to, even in tough times. And I think there's something incredibly raw and real about that, right? And it's Jesus who showed up and showed us that being good isn't always about staying in your comfort zone, right? Like, he got people so annoyed that they killed him. Now, he did it in the perfect way. Like, you may go, well, I've got people that annoy me enough that I want to kill them. That's probably not Jesus-like on your part, nor are they being Jesus-like on their part, probably, right? Because we all have things we need to grow in. But he lived out this love, this kind of love that puts others first, no matter the cost. And it wasn't about just saying nice things. It wasn't even uh, about doing nice things. It was doing the right thing, even if that was the hard thing. And that's what we're called to as Christians to do the right thing, even when it's the hard thing, because of who God is and because of our relationship with him. And I think in Jesus, you see this perfect mix of love and truth. And man, I always try to figure out how to navigate that. I never do it right, right? It's why I need Jesus every day. And he wasn't just offering a ticket to heaven. He's inviting us on this journey with him to be changed by him, to walk along with him and try to live out love and truth in him. And it's not always going to be easy. It's not like it's a walk in the park. But there's some things that, uh, about facing those challenges, about stepping out of what feels safe, that helps us grow. And it's about trusting him, not just because of what we get out of it, but because of who he is and what he calls us to and what he has done. And it makes it all worth it, right? And it's like living life on the edge, but with the safety net of faith and wisdom. And it's not about being a daredevil just for the thrill of it. Like, I like adrenaline. I like to do risky things. 
But like doing risky things that can hurt you just to do them is dumb. But doing things that God calls us to do can be exciting, can be invigorating, can be go, wow, this is, this is, this is fun, walking with God. And I think it's more about understanding the risks in our lives, whether they're physical, right, like, you know, extreme sports stuff, or, you know, there's all kinds of things to do in Colorado that, that, are, that are like that. But it's more about, like, the choices we make, right? Like, maybe it's changing careers or moving to a new place or, like, serving the church in a way that you're like, oh, I did that before and somebody hurt me or it was frustrating, and we give up. And I think the real deal is not to run away from those things because, let's be honest, life without risk is boring, right? If you have nothing that's fun or you go, oh, I never take any risks, like, oh, well, maybe you just wrap yourself in bubble, bubble wrap and, and then nothing will ever hurt you, right? But we know that doesn't work either because you get sweaty and chafed, right? But, you know, like, <laughs> but I think we want to do that. We got to handle those risks with the sort of respect and thoughtfulness that comes in a real faith in Jesus. And that respect is all about knowing how big he is and how wise he is compared to our wisdom. It's not about being scared of him. It's about respecting him. It's about taking a step back and asking for his guidance before we jump into something. It's like when you're about to make a big decision, you shouldn't just go with your gut or what feels right at the moment. Like, man, pray about it. Hit the pause button. Read some scripture. Ask for some thoughts from somebody else who maybe is more mature or has some expertise in that. And, and go, wow, you've walked with God longer. I've seen you be successful in this. I'm thinking this. Here's your thoughts. Right? Because I go, oftentimes we can go, oh, I feel really strongly about this. And we jump into it and you go, oh, man, I wish I would have thought about this for a minute. Right? Or maybe it's just me. I don't know. But then there's the spiritual side of things. Because when we're doing something big for God, like you're starting a new project or figuring out how to serve him in great ways, um, you know, and thinking, oh, it, it's, it's easy to start thinking that, oh, I, I got this figured out and I'm all that, right? Because it was successful and it did work. And I go, but that's really a trap. Because we have to keep our egos in check and remember where our strength really comes from, God. It's like, you know, putting an invisible armor that keeps you safe from getting too full of yourself and helps keep you on track. So I think in the end, it's about facing challenges and the risks of life with a humble heart and a smart head. Like you have to be humble in these things. Humble to God, humble to his word, humble to the, the consequences of bad decisions as well. We talked a little bit about that last week, right? And I think being open to his guidance and his wisdom that he really wants to give to us because we're called to live bra bravely, to step out into the unknown, to not live in fear, but I think always with the guidance and wisdom and respect for God and who he is. And I think it's about making sure that our bold moves are in line with God, his heart, and his words, and keeping those decisions rooted in our respect and our relationship with God. Because the Bible tells us that the fearing God, fearing God isn't just natural, that it's crucial. Right? Every time an angel of the Lord appears to someone, they always have the same response. They fall down as though dead. Like when Peter is in the boat, figures out that it's Jesus, he's like, away from me, I'm a sinful person. It's ordering that relationship. It wasn't this fear. It was just like, oh, the, I, I, I was shocked. I saw who I really was compared to who God is. And I think it helps us to keep spiritually alert and keep us away from pitfalls that happen when we stray off God's path. So today, is, let's explore, explore a little bit this concept of, of healthy fear. And the first thought is this, the, the protective role of godly fear. Because how does it help us make wise choices? And, and how does it make our relationship with God deeper and more meaningful? And how can this kind of fear actually be a positive and a life-changing force in our spiritual journey? And so let, let's dig in here a little bit. Because... This idea here that, that, that fear is a good thing and has a protective role is a little bit interesting because this protective side of fear, especially in our spiritual life, comes from Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 16. It says, the wise hear the Lord and shun evil, but a fool is hot-headed and yet feels secure, which is me in every fight with my wife at the beginning, Right? Where I go, I'm sure I'm right. She has to be wrong. And the more upset I get, the more I'm sure she's wrong. Until I like 
humble out and cool off and go, well, maybe I wasn't 100% right. <laughs> right? And I think this particular verse really hits it on the head about how fear, particularly the fear of the Lord, can be a good thing. Because it's wise when we fear God. It's wise when we don't think, oh, I have all the answers. Because guess what? You don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. Only God has all the answers. And when we talk about fearing the Lord, we're not talking about being so scared that we're stuck in a place that you just go, oh, I, I can't do anything and I, I don't want to. That's not healthy fear, right? That's like terror that makes you freeze and go, ooh. Like in that moment at the deliverance shack, that fear, if I would have just froze, that would have been bad. I do not want to know the outcome of that. But that fear that goes, I need to do something different. That's a good thing. And maybe in your life, God is showing you something where you go, oh, ah, God is like getting my attention here. I'm a little bit afraid if I keep on down this path, what this will lead me to. I have this vivid me memory being 18 years old, living in Kodiak, Alaska, and making all of the wrong decisions in my entire life. And I'm working with these guys, and I'm making all this money, and having all kinds of fun, and partying really hard, and it was like the dream for a redneck from Wisconsin. <laughs> and I remember sitting at this breakfast table as I'm eating like a bagel, and the two guys that I worked with were having their breakfast. The one guy was having a water glass full of Canadian Hunter whiskey with a, a Rainier beer chaser, which is what he drank every morning and then all throughout the rest of the day as we worked construction. And then his buddy roommate, who both had been divorced and lived together, was having his breakfast, which was his like three foot long bong and just smoking till he was happy enough to go to work. And I'm sitting there eating my bagel and I just had this moment of clarity that said, I have to get out of here right now or I'm gonna turn into this. I gotta get out of here. And I, I did. Like I, I, I made a ticket and got a ticket and, and went home and they go, ooh, this isn't good. It wasn't because I was super wise. It was because I was afraid of what was gonna happen to me. And I think God loves you enough to help those things happen along in your life. And oftentimes, it, it may be a moment like that where you just go, oh, I have a moment of clarity. Most of the time for me, it comes through somebody else's voice, right? Like I normally think God's plan A is like opening up a cloud and, and going, oh, here's Hans, what you should do, right? Most of the time it, it comes through a wise person in my life, through my wife, through a great friend, it, my kids going, hey, dad, mm. I go, oh, maybe I ought to hear that and respond to that. Is there a biblical truth to that? I need to listen to that. And I think it, it comes into this deep respect and this awe for God's power and his holiness. It's recognizing just how good and right he is and understanding that we're accountable to him for our actions. And I think this kind of fear, actually, it's a gift of God. It's not meant to scare us, but it's meant to keep us safe. And I think, if you think about it this way, when you really respect and you revere the Lord... We naturally steer clear of evil. And this kind of fear, it's like a guiding light. It keeps you from making rash decisions or unwise decisions. It's like having a compass that always points towards what God says is right. And I think by fearing God, we gain the wisdom to know what's right and wrong. And it helps us to navigate life with this clear moral and spiritual direction. You know, and if you bring that into your everyday life, right? Every day we have choices and situations that either can pull us away from God or pull us closer to God. And I think the fear of the Lord is like that safety net that keeps us safe in those decisions. It's that little voice that tells you, run. But do you listen to it? It's that little voice that, that says, hey, think twice before you respond in anger. Right? Like one of the best things that I've figured out is like if I'm frustrated, I probably should shut my mouth. Because my first thought is never helpful. It is never kind. And it always starts another fight that I then have to go back and fix the first fight. It doesn't fix the first fight. It only adds another fight. This is typically with my wife, by the way. But, you know, it happens with some of you all too, right? And I go, oh, I wonder if I just paused for a moment, didn't say the first thing that came to my thought, and took a breath and got rid of that fight or flight syndrome in my heart. I go, is this going to be helpful? Eh, probably not. Probably should just keep it to myself. And talk about what we're talking about. Or maybe it's walking away into a temptation. Maybe it's that, ooh, 
man, I'm still feeling frustrated. I need a break. And oh, I'm going to get on the computer. And it's taking a moment going, is that what I really want? Is that going to help me? Am I going to feel guilty afterwards? Am I going to feel shame? Yeah, I probably am. Probably need to be, make a more wise decision here. And I think sometimes it's just choosing kindness over being indifferent. But it's God calling us to do that. And I think I want to encourage each of us to, to think about how this fear of the Lord plays out in our daily life and in our daily choices. Do you find yourself top, stopping to think, what would God say about this situation? Or you go, no, I want to do it. I'm just going to go. I go, no, take a minute. Think about what God wants for you. Because are you more likely to avoid doing things that could distance you from him by making that decision? Or is this decision going to pull you closer to him? And I think that respectful fear of God is a guardian. It's a helpful thing. It's a guardrail that keeps you from, from going off the edge. And it honors him. And it shows our love to others as well. And so I think embrace that kind of protective fear. Let it shape the, way, the decisions you make and the ways that you act and live in this kind of fear of God that's not just about you know, getting wisdom, but it's also about a shielding process to protect you from the dangers of the world. Second thought is this. I think cultivating a healthy fear in our Christian journey. Because we need this. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, this is Paul speaking, and he's like, hey, you gotta, you got to continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And this fear and trembling isn't talking about like, oh, I'm shaking and I'm quaking here. It, it's understanding, and it's approaching your spiritual life and your relationship with God with a deep, deep respect and seriousness. It's recognizing how significant our salvation is and being amazed by God's grace and his love for us. I am constantly amazed that God loves somebody like me. It totally makes sense that somebody loves somebody like you guys. Right? I look at Sam and I go, of course God loves Sam. Who Everybody loves Sam. Right? And I just go, gosh. But that he loves me? That he gives me good things that I don't deserve? And I go, you know... You think about it like if you're trusted with, with carrying something that's incredibly precious and valuable and you really don't want to, you know, mess it up. You know, I think that's how we should treat our spiritual journey. It's this priceless, precious part of our life that deserves full attention and respect. You know, I talked about Christmas a little bit ago. One of our favorite Christmas traditions is we go to like one of those pottery painted places and we paint some plaints. We, li we started doing it when our daughter was first born. We did a little footprint, and um, every year since then, we've done a footprint or a handprint at Christmas time, each one of the kids. So if you've ever been into our house, it's like one of my wife's most treasured possessions. When the fires, when the Marshall Fire was coming through, she's like, we need to get all the plates off the walls if the fire gets close. And I was like, babe, I don't know. Like, really? <laughs> she's like, yes, really. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I have a fear of the Lord, but I got a fear of my wife too, right? And, and, and I go... You know, you, you think about it, and so when the kids were growing up, these have always been a prized possession. So one day, Anne is upstairs, and Anne, Anne and I are both upstairs. The kids are downstairs in the living room where all of these things are around the living room, and we can hear the kids playing, and they're throwing this knife, this rubber, like, <laughs> knife, right? Our house, you never know. Our house, you never know, but it was a plastic knife. So they're throwing this knife around, and Anne's like, hey, stop doing that. You're going to break one of the plates. That was her threat no matter what they were doing, right? So they, they, they are quiet for a little bit longer. And my son, who's the instigator, who probably may or may not have gotten it from me, um, he starts poking at my daughter and throws the knife and then runs off. And so my daughter, being the perfect older sibling, uh, grabs the knife and chucks it at him as he runs out the door, nails one of those plates, and it drops straight down and shatters on the wood floor. And everyone in the house went, oh, no. And Anne goes, what was that? <laughs> I didn't do it, and I was scared to death. <laughs> no response. Terror. <laughs> what was that? Was that a plate? <laughs> as, doo -doo 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 -doo, as she comes down the stairs, and it's just shattered. And I come in at the same time, and Anne is just sitting there, and the tears are welling up, and she just bursts into tears and goes upstairs. And I asked the kids recently, like, so what did you think was happening? They're like, oh, we thought she was going to kill us for sure. 
that's the fear of the Lord that we can have sometimes, right? Like, oh, we're going to die. We're going to get nuked. You read the book of Job, right? Like, ooh, you, God's going to get you. And the issue wasn't the anger as much as just this was a prized possession. This was so precious. And this is one of a kind. And you can't replace it. And she just was sad that this precious thing was now destroyed. And I go, I think that's how God feels about us and our spiritual journey and our walk with him, right? He goes, oh, it's not that I'm mad at you, although you're going against what I called you to do. I'm heartbroken that my precious thing, this valuable piece that's way more than a plate, is shattered. And I, in my imperfectness, decided, hey, I'm going to do a great Christmas present. I spent... I. I have no idea how many hours, but it was a lot of hours. Super gluing every little piece of that together and putting it all back together. And you, you have a hard time knowing now which plate it was that broke, right? And I go, yet yeah, God does that perfectly. I go, man, I was so broken and so messed up and generational junk and horrible decisions. And yet God can make me perfect through Jesus Christ, just like he could do it with you. So it's not about fearing and trembling. It's about respecting and going, God going, oh, I just want something so much better for you. Don't destroy what I've given you. And I think if we can aim to have that kind of healthy fear, this respect that goes beyond just trembling, but it goes hand in hand with this deep love and devotion to him. And I think in that balance, we find the real life that God wants us to live in his grace and his mercy. And it's truly a life that honors him. And brings us joy in being saved. So third and final thought here. I think embracing the rewards of a God-fearing life. Because I want to look here at this last thought. And something really special. And this benefit that comes from our fear in him. In, in Psalms chapter 25 and verse 14. It says, the Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. And I think this verse really helps us see the amazing things that can happen when we have this respectful, reverent fear in a relationship with God. It's like it unlocks a closer, more personal relationship with him, one where there's real understanding and real connection. And I think having this kind of fear isn't about just making better choices. It's about welcoming us into a deeper relationship, a more meaningful relationship with him. And when we approach God with that kind of respect and awe and understand how holy he is, how powerful he is, it's like we're making room in our hearts for him in this genuine, close-knit bond to him. And I think in that space, we start to share more and more with him, our wishes, our hopes, our, 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 our desires. And he goes, yeah, I want that for you. I want you to be happy. I want you to be joyful. I don't want you just to be happy because happiness is fleeting. It depends on those circumstances. But joy, even in the face of horrible things, we can have because of our relationship with God. And I go, you got to imagine it like any true friendship, any real deep friendship. There's this mutual respect. There's this real grasp of each other's values and needs. And when we fear God in the right way, it's not just about respecting him. It's about opening our hearts and really understanding him as he understands us. We start to see his influence in our lives and we grasp it more clearly and have this intentional, deep level relationship with him. And, and when you think about how we can de develop that kind of relationship in our everyday lives, it begins with how you approach him in prayer and worship. Do we just talk to God casually or do we come to him with respect fit for the king of kings? And yet, he goes, I want you to have a friendship with me. I want you to talk to me. And I think this respect shouldn't just be for times of prayer, but it should be how we live our life. And so as you go through your life trying to figure out how do I do this? How do I have a respectful, right, real relationship with Jesus? And I've got a couple of thoughts. And the first one is this. I think just having a dedicated prayer time. You go, ah, oh, it's the same old thing go, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Jesus calls us to the same old thing all the time, right? But I go, if you don't pray to God, and praying isn't just you talking to him, talking about all the things you want. Praying to him is also listening to what he has for you. And don't just limit it to asking for stuff. Respect him and, and understand him and praise him for who he is. And then contemplative Bible study. I think we've been really good as a history, as a church, being very much studious Bible studiers, right? Where you're, there's an educational component to it. This year, my whole goal and every morning as I read is going, I want to look for who God is in this. Not what I need to do, how I should respond. And I'm so much like a tasker and a doer and like, oh, let me just fix it. 
I'm just focused on, okay, what's the truth about who God is? Do that. You'll understand him better and you'll fear more in a good, healthy way. And maybe you go, maybe you need to do ref journaling reflections where you go, oh, I'm going to go through this and talk and, and talk about how I see God. Talk about the ways that I can praise him and understand him in a better way. And notice the shifts in how I act or the decisions that I made are going, oh, if I trust God, I didn't do that thing that I, I've been stuck in doing. And then I think just being mindful in what you're doing day in and day out. When you're about to make a big decision or even just a decision, being mindful, is this what God wants? And just practicing that mindfulness, that respect of, of, of being and understanding that God is with you and talking to him about that. And then just share and discuss it, like talking about this stuff talking about this is how I saw God in my life. This is how I see God walking with me. This is how I, I slowed down and I contemplated that and God really blessed it. And then I think as much as that, that contemplative Bible study of who God is, acts of obedience need to be included in this. Because it can be so easy to go, yeah, it's just me and God and I just want to feel it and I just want to understand him and I just want to know that he's with me and then I'm going to do whatever I flip and want. That doesn't work super good. I tried that for a lot of years, and I go, it doesn't work. I need to be obedient to his word as well. And, so may, and it's not like, okay, I'm going to be perfect. That doesn't work either, right? But you go, what's one area where I can just make a choice to go, I'm going to try and walk closer with God in this, see him with me, see his help in this, understand his grace, his mercy, and really taking it. And then last and finally, just worship and praise. Like, praise him for who he is. Worship him for all the good things that he's done. And make your, your, your worship a response of how much you respect and are in awe of him. And celebrate his, his goodness and his greatness. And I think we can, we can just get that and be in there. You know, and I think this fear shouldn't paralyze you. It should cause you to act. Psalm 25, 14, right? It says, the Lord confides in those who fear him, makes his covenant known to them. God wants to have that kind of relationship with you. And when we fear God in the right way, he shares more with us. He reveals his plans, his promises. And that kind of fear opens a door to a, a more fulfilling and a rich experience in our faith. You know, and, uh, you know, as I was thinking about this, and I've been reading in Job the last week, in my Bible chronological plan. And it's really interesting to me, because Job starts out really strong. And he's like, you know, he's this faithful man and all this stuff. And then as I read it, I'm like, what is wrong? Why does, why does God let this happen to this guy? He's righteous and he's a good guy. And then he's got these dirtbag friends, right, that come and go, you just need to repent because clearly you did something wrong that God is mad at you. And if you don't get your act straight, it's going to get worse. And he's really going to get on you. <laughs> Job's like, what else could he do? And he's, he's faithful all throughout this. And then he gets to this point where he's like, God, what the heck? Why are you doing this to me? And what's really interesting to me, and one of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible says, and I don't have this in there, Dean, so don't look for it, um, but is uh, where God starts to respond and he goes, brace yourself like a man because I'm going to talk to you. What's interesting, though, is it says, the Lord, all caps, which in Hebrew is Yahweh, or Jehovah, which is like God's personal name. It's what was in Genesis chapter 1 in the creation, where it says the Lord, Yahweh, was with them, and they were together, and there was no Adam and Eve. There's nothing separate them. And so it's God, even as he's saying, hey, brace yourself, because we're going to talk, but he's coming in this very personal relationship. And then he doesn't nuke him. He does not come in there. He's on this deep, deep, personal level that flies in the face of the brother, the, the, the guys that are there trying to help him because they said, hey, if God's silence and his, you know, punishment is going to come if you don't repent. He didn't repent. And yet God shows up speaking directly to him in a personal way. And that's what God wants for you. He wants to be personal with you. You go, but I messed up really, really bad. He goes, that's okay. I still want to have a relationship with you. Because having a healthy fear of God isn't about living in a state of constant worry or dread. It's about being aware of God's greatness, his holiness, and letting that awareness shape our lives in a way that honors him. It's the kind of fear that brings wisdom, that brings protection, and a more profound connection to our creator. So let's all aim to blend that godly fear with our everyday faith journey. 
Let it guide us towards being filled with wisdom and safety and deep spiritual satisfaction and joy. And may our hearts always be pulled towards the amazing majesty of God, living every day in the light and love of his grace. Let's pray for communion. Heavenly Father, God, I'm grateful that, that we can just come to you. That God, that, that, that you are Yahweh, Jehovah, a God that wants to be personal with us and that that, God, we can have this protective role of fear, that that, that fear can really cultivate something great in us, and, and that greatness is what you really want, is a close relationship with you that allows us to walk unblemished, untainted, and without terror, but with respect and awe. And, God, as I pray, I just pray, God, that you would just convict our hearts of the areas where we're not trusting you and we're trying to figure it out on our own, where we're trying to be arrogant and prideful and, and do it without you. And God, help us to see that you're right there with us, that you want to be with us, that, that maybe we have to brace ourselves like a strong man or a strong woman and deal with the consequences of our sin, but that you're right there with us to walk along with us, to, to guide us along the way, not to, to, to bring terror and, and shame, but to bring closeness and healing and just like I tried to put that, that plate back together, you in a perfect way. Pull all those broken pieces and put it back together. And God, I just pray that right now as we take communion, remember Jesus who, who came to cover over all of that, all those mistakes, all those sins, that we don't have to try and fix it ourselves, but that Jesus covers over all our sins. Help us embrace that. Grateful that, that we have that grace, that we have that mercy. And God, I pray for those who maybe have never made that decision to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus in baptism. That God, I just pray that, that they would make a decision today to take a step forward, to, to open your word, to get open about what's going on in their life and be done with shame and guilt and brokenness. To be made new by the, the creator of all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray.